For some weeks on Sunday mornings, we've been on a topic that I'm calling the Ministry of Reconciliation. And I want to continue on that today. If you haven't been with us, we've already covered quite a bit of ground. And uh, there are real answers in this. The further I'm going, the more I'm seeing that. Uh, turn with me to 2 Corinthians 5, and we'll read another verse on the way there. If you would put up on the screen Psalm 133.1, but you're turning to 2 Corinthians 5. In, uh, read with me on the screen when you, when you can. He said, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Everybody say, together. Yeah. In unity. Yeah. Unity. Uh, just because you're together doesn't mean you're in unity. <laughs> huh? <laughs> I see a lot of knowing looks. People are going, eh? <laughs> and another way of saying that is just because you have a relationship, that doesn't mean you have fellowship. And fellowship is the joy of relationship. If you don't have the fellowship, the relationship can mean very little. He said, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Well, the, the, the opposite of that is true. Uh, how bad and how unpleasant it is <laughs> when brethren are together in strife, right? In animosity and at odds with one another instead of being in unity. Verse 2 this unity is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard. Even Aaron's beard that went down to the skirts of his garments. There, there's a flow from the head, the head of the church. That if the, all the members, and the Bible tells us that every one of us is a member in the body, the body of Christ. We're somewhere in the body. He's the head. We're the body. And if we're all unified with the head and with each other, there is an anointing that flows from the head over the whole body, all the way to the skirts of his garments, I said. Thank you, Lord. But this is connected with us getting along, us being in unity. Can you see, you can begin to see why the New Testament commandment is for us to love one another. Yes, you can see why the enemy works ceaselessly to start and perpetrate strife. Hmm? The, the enemy is continually trying to stir up something, yes. cause problems. And it, it is, has been far too easy for him to do so. People have cooperated with him so quickly. You know, don't be quick to believe bad things about your brother and sister. Don't, don't judge. Don't be quick. Even if you heard about a brother or sister doing a bad thing, for all you know, by the time you heard it, they've repented and got right with God. And, and if you hadn't repented over something, they could be in better shape than you are <laughs> by the time you heard it. <laughs> and even if they haven't, you're not their judge, right? You're in the same boat with them. You've missed it. Hmm? Anybody, anybody in here that never has missed it? I, I, don't you raise your hand, don't you? <laughs> don't you? Uh -uh. <laughs> All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Well, that's what they did. Same thing you did. And you said, oh yeah, but I'd never, never say that. 
That is a judging statement. I would never do that. You already have. No, I would. Sin is sin. Disobedience. Did you disobey God? Did you violate light? No need trying to, to rate things. The spirit part of it is the same. Hmm? You yielded to your flesh. You, you yielded to disobedience. Uh, the other is details. The Lord's looking at the heart. Right? A lot to be said about that. But moving right along. He said it's like the dew of Hermon. As the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing. Even life forevermore. Is there a connection between unity and anointing and blessing? Yes, there is. You'll find in numerous places where they were in one place and one mind and one accord, great things happened. Right? There were great manifestations of God's spirit and his power and his goodness. The enemy knows this. I mean... If half the Christians on the planet got together on anything, the enemies had it in that area. Is that right? (laughs) We're told a giant percentage of Christians in this country don't vote. A giant percentage. If all the Christians just voted, it would totally change the country. Totally change it. But people want to get, you know, well, I'm I'm not like your camp. I'm not like your group. Uh, In 1 Corinthians, uh, they were dealing with it back then. One said, I'm of Paul. Another one said, I'm of Cephas, Peter. I'm of Apollos. Uh, another one said, I'm not of any of y'all. I'm just of Jesus, Jesus only. <laughs> and separation. And yet the Bible says there's one God. There's one mediator between God and men. There's one spirit. There's one church. Hmm? But the enemy has been able to, to, to create and feed and stir up strife. I mean between husbands and wives, between parents and children, between siblings, between churches and pastors and co-workers. We have been too easy to play. The enemy just bring a few feelings, bring a few thoughts and you go, huh, I don't like them. So he he brings a few thoughts and feelings to them and they go, huh, I don't like you either. (laughs) And I'm sure evil spirits are going, this is too easy. This is too easy. They don't even try to resist it. They don't even try. Just, well, let's bring them some more. Bring them some more. And you got churches splitting. And you got divorce everywhere. And, hmm? That's not unity. And it cuts off the anointing. And it prevents blessing. And I don't want to yield to it. How about you? The Bible said neither give place. Don't give any place to the enemy. In 2 Corinthians the 5th chapter, are you there? 2 Corinthians 5, 17. What are we talking about? The ministry of what? Reconciliation. Reconciliation. What is Reconciliation. Reconciliation is to to make one again. To uh, if people are at odds, and fussing and fighting, it's reconciliation is is getting them back together again. But the biggest issue was getting us back together with God. And you get that fixed, then the other is fixable. He said, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature or creation. All things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. This is on the inside, in the the inner man. Verse 18, 
All things are of God. This is on the inside. Who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. The Father has made the way for sinful man to be back in full fellowship with him. And it's all through Jesus. When Adam and Eve sinned and disobeyed God and chose God's enemy to believe him and listen to him instead of him, you remember that they were driven out of the garden where they fellowshiped with him. And there was a separation. Well, God is perfectly pure and holy. He's light, no darkness at all. He's good and no evil. And uh, he, he still loved his creation, but he can't justly and fairly treat them and their descendants like nothing's wrong. That would be unjust. That would be unfair. The wages of sin is death. One thing we've got to know about God, He is fair. A lot of people have shaken their fist and said, you know, that's not fair. God, you're not fair. Never was a bigger lie ever told. These are people full of ignorance and darkness shaking their fist. He's the answer. But I assure you, he never has done anything unfair with anybody. He is perfect justice. He's, he is the righteous judge of all the earth. He is so righteous. He is so fair. He is so just. He won't pervert justice for anybody. No matter how much he cares about you, he won't do something unfair or unjust for you or with you. And so in order to receive human beings back into full fellowship with himself, he couldn't treat us like nothing happened because it did happen. One of the biggest mistakes, we're going to see this further as we go, one of the biggest mistakes that people make concerning this subject of reconciliation is trying to act like nothing's wrong. Did you hear that phrase? Yeah. Trying to act like nothing's wrong. Trying to act like there's no problem. There was a problem when Adam and Eve disobeyed God. And, and the wages of sin is death. So what's fair is for them to die and be separated from God. That's what's fair. And even though that's what's fair, God didn't want that. Because right. <laughs> he loves us. Right? So how, how can he be reconciled to us and treat us like we had never sinned when we had, how can he do it and be fair and be just? Jesus said, I'll pay for it. It had to be paid for. It had to be judged or else God's not fair. It had to be dealt with. It had to be judged. And Jesus, God's son, became man. So he fully qualifies as man. He is man. But he never committed sin. Oh, he's my hero. How about you? Elsewise, he couldn't have been the substitute for us. He'd have needed salvation just like us. He never committed sin. Where Adam and Eve failed, he did not. The, the wilderness temptation 
was where the enemy, up to that time, every man and woman from Adam and Eve on that had ever lived on the earth at some point had yielded to sin. The enemy had 100% success in tempting people and them yielding to sin. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God until Jesus. Woo! Until Jesus. And that's why when, when Jesus was baptized and he came out of the water and the Holy Spirit came on him, the devil doesn't know everything, but he can see things like this. Anybody can see this. He thought, oh no. <laughs> Look at all this anointing, right? So he's got to do something to stop this because does anybody know what the anointing does? Huh? It removes burdens. Whose burdens? That's the devil's stuff. It destroys yokes. Whose yokes? It's the enemy's. This is the enemy's work. He can work on getting yokes in people's lives and families for multiple generations. And the anointing can destroy them in milliseconds. So he knows he's got serious problems with all this anointing if he can't change it. So he pulls out everything he's ever been successful in tempting human beings and he subjected Jesus to off the chart temptation for 40 days and 40 nights. Now you know he's desperate when he starts showing Jesus all the kingdoms of the world in them and says all of it's been given to me but I'll give it to you. You know he's desperate. But Jesus said, you get behind me. Yeah. Woo yeah. Glory to God. You worship the Lord your God and him only. I mean, he came out in the power of the Spirit. Amen. No sin. No guilt. No condemnation. And because of that, he could be the sinless, spotless sacrifice for us. He took the punishment. He took the, the judgment. He became sin with our sin. Keep reading here and you'll see this. 2 Corinthians 5, 19, it says, uh, uh, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. We have a ministry. All of us who are new creations in Christ Jesus have a ministry and a message. The ministry of reconciliation, what? Getting people back in fellowship with God. Right? Yes. That's everybody's job. Yes. You know, that's what uh, Kim was tearing up about. That 11 year old yes. is functioning fully in the ministry of reconciliation yes. on the school bus. Yes. Got to work. What's, what, what's uh, he telling th this child? Hmm? God loves you. He, he wants to be in fellowship with you. Yes. He'll take care of you. Yes. You don't have to have this. You don't have to do this. That's, that's this ministry right here. Yes. Yes. If Jesus was here in the flesh, he would tell that child that. Yes. Right. That's right. yeah. But he's telling it through this 11 year old. Yes. That's awesome. He is in Christ's stead pleading with this young one, be reconciled to God. Yes. Be, come get right with God. Let, let him help you. Hmm? You don't have to stay at odds with God. Verse 21. For he has made him to be sin for us. Who knew no sin. That's Jesus. That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. If you are righteous before God. 
he can bring you into full fellowship with himself fairly, justly. He can treat you and bless you. Is that right? Because you were righteous. And even though we weren't, Jesus took the sin and paid for it. He didn't deserve that. So we could be made and treated as the righteous, though we didn't deserve that. This is the ministry of reconciliation. This is being reconciled to God. Oh, somebody say, bless you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Glory be to God. Go to Acts, please, the second chapter. Let's get into some specifics of how to do this. How are we reconciled to God? We've touched on by what means. It's by means of what Jesus has done. But our part, uh, before I go further, let me re remind you of what the text said in 2 Corinthians 5. What is our message to people? Be reconciled yes. to God. Everybody say that out loud. Be reconciled to God. Well, if everybody is already right with God, there's no need for that. There's no need for any ministry. There's no need for me to tell people, uh, be reconciled. Be, be, come and be right with God. And uh, it is true that Jesus has paid the price for everyone's sin, past, present, future. He doesn't need to, to go back to the cross. He doesn't need to do anything else for anybody's sins now or a hundred years from now. Has he paid the price for all, all sins for everyone? Well, some have reasoned intellectually that, well, since he's done that, then everybody's reconciled to God, regardless of what they do or not. Or even if you're an unbeliever all your life, when you die, you'll find out that he had already reconciled you. No, that's not what the Bible teaches. That's not what the Bible preaches. Even though it has been provided, it must be believed and received. Or elsewise, you won't be. You won't enjoy this reconciliation. We still have a choice in the matter. Hmm? And the Bible said, he that believes and is baptized will be saved. He that believes not will be condemned. So no, according to the scriptures, everyone will not be saved. Even though Jesus has paid the price. Why? Because it's up to you whether you want to be in fellowship with God or not. If you don't want him, you can say no. If you don't want to accept what Jesus has done to reconcile you to the Father, you do not have to receive it. You can say, I don't believe in that. I don't believe in God. I don't believe in all this. But that'd be the worst mistake of your existence. Because if you don't want to be with God, there's only one other place to go. This is serious. And it's not that God sent you there. You didn't want him. You didn't want to be with him. So there's only one other place to go. Now look with me. In Acts, how are we reconciled to God? Acts 2 and 36. So we say, well, what, about, what about all these other religions? All of it can't be true. You have to decide what you think is true, what you believe is true. If the Bible is true, there are no other gods. If the Bible is true, there's only one way to the Father and to salvation, and that's Jesus. Hmm? If you don't believe that, then you don't believe the Bible. You're off the script. You're doing your own thing. You can make up, you know, just because you believe something real strong doesn't make it true. 
You can believe something with all your heart, soul, and mind. You can die for what you believe and it be a total lie. Just because you believe something, that doesn't make it true. But Jesus said, He is the way, the truth, and the life and the light. Hallelujah. And that no man comes to the Father except by Him. I believe that. So I can't believe in other religions. I can't. Because if I, if I accept what they say, I'm disagreeing with what he said. I can't. So you, need, you need to be open-minded. You need to be, you need to be tolerant of, of other beliefs. Well, I'm not trying to force anything uh, down their throat. But no, I do not have to be accommodating to other beliefs. <laughs> huh? No. Sure. Uh, right now in the world, you can believe anything you want to. Right? And if you want to believe that, I can't make you. God's not going to make you. But don't tell me I have to make allowances for it. Don't tell me I have to include it in my beliefs. No. No. There's one God. Just one. One. <laughs> I've traveled some. And it's amazing how many gods you see out there. Oh, dear me. It's terrible. It's awful. I mean, there, there are places they got, they got hundreds and hundreds of gods. A god for this, a god for that, a god for the front door, a god for the back door, a god for the bushes, a god for the water. <laughs> We're laughing, but they actually believe this junk. It's terrible. You can believe it with, you can believe it with all your heart and mind. It doesn't make it true. It doesn't make it true. I'm so thankful. I believe the Bible. It is the Word of God. It is truth. Complete truth. Hallelujah. How are we reconciled to God? Acts 2.36. Peter's preaching in the very early days of the church. And you'll see the ministry of reconciliation in this preaching. He said, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made the same Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Somebody say, He is Lord, he is Lord. and he is, the Christ. he is the Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. And they said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? So here we see they must have believed what he told them. Right? Elsewise they would have just discounted it or rejected it because they're, they're, they're touched in their heart. And they say, well, what, are, what do we do? In other words, how, how do we get this fixed? Yeah. Right? Yeah. How do we get reconciled? So number one, you got to believe it. Right. Yeah. And so what did he tell them then? Verse 38, Peter said to them, repent. <laughs> this is an unpopular word nowadays. And it's so sad because repentance is a gift. It's a gift. A gift. Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Three big parts of reconciliation. What we do, what our part is. Believe. The good news. Can you see this? Yes. And do what? Repent. Yes. And then do what? Receive. Receive. That's how you're reconciled to God. Amen. Believe. Repent. Receive. Anybody in here that's been born again? Is that how it happened? Yes. Huh? You believe something. You believe the good news. You believed you were in need of a Savior. You believed, right? You believed. You, you were moved like them, right? You got up and came to the altar or you knelt where you were or you prayed with somebody over the TV or the radio or, or wherever. Why? Because you were moved. You thought, oh, that's true. Oh, that's true. That's true. I, I, I've been at odds with God. I, I need a Savior. I'm, I'm not okay. And, and Jesus paid the price. I believe it. So you repent. Yes. 
And that's part of what you're already doing. Repent means you are humbling yourself before him and acknowledging yes. he's right yes. and you've been in the wrong. Yes. God, we, we don't need to plead with God to be reconciled to us. This is a one-way thing. <laughs> you know, when human beings get at odds with each other, getting back together can be something on both sides. Right? Well, I'm sorry I, I said that to you. And the other person can say, well, you know, I said some things to you too. So both sides are repenting so that they can be reconciled. But with God, it's only one side because he never changes. He doesn't need to. And so when we're not in full fellowship with him, there's only one side that needs to repent, that needs to change. And, and, and that is one of the biggest definitions of the word repent is change. It involves humility. And it involves a change of heart and mind and word and deed. You come to him and you say, Father, I, I've been wrong. I've been wrong. I, you didn't miss it. I missed it. And then you do what? You, you believe. You repent. And then what? You receive by faith. You take forgiveness. You take cleansing and washing. You take the righteousness and holiness of the Lord. You receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit. You receive your healing. You can receive all these good things because you are reconciled. You are, you are in his favor. You are in his good graces. You didn't earn it. You didn't merit it. But you got to believe it. And you got to receive it. And you do have to repent. Now go with me to 1 John. Let's talk some more about this. First John. I tell you what, on your, on your way there. Stop by 1 Corinthians 10. 1 Corinthians 10 and 19. He said, uh, What say I then that the idol is anything or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything? Just like we were talking a moment ago about all these false gods. That was happening back then. Is still happening today. People praying to and worshiping and offering incense and sacrifice to false gods. It's an abomination. Yes. It's not okay. No. And it's a blight on our nation yes. that you ask God for his help and you got all this junk in the middle of it too. Yes. Hmm? Sure. But because of us, the salt and light of the earth. He'll do a lot of things yes, sir. just because we ask him to. Yes. Amen. Verse 20. He said, I say the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils. Now that's the word for demons. And not to God. So this is why people have spiritual experience in the worship of these false gods and idols. They do have real spiritual experiences, some of them, but it's not God. It's wrong spirits. And that's one reason why some folk are so adamant. They know they had a genuine spiritual experience. So they're adamant about it's real. Yeah, it's real. It ain't God. Yeah, it's spiritual, but it's not the Holy Spirit. He said they sacrifice to demons. And not to God. And I would not that you should have fellowship with demons. 
Can Christians, believers, have fellowship with demons? He's writing to the saints at Corinth, right? These are believers. So it's possible to fellowship with God's enemies, even intimately. Would that affect your fellowship with the Father? <laughs> Does it mean you're lost? No. But can it affect your fellowship with Him? Yes, it can. And this is what a lot of folks today, when they talk about grace, they're not acknowledging this. Yes, grace has paid the price. But that doesn't mean that if we fellowship with wrong things, right. it's not going to affect our fellowship That's right. with the Father. That's right. hmm? yes, sir. It would you. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> if somebody that's real close to you fellowships intimately with your enemy, yeah. you going to be okay with that? Yeah. <laughs> we don't expect him to be. He said, I don't want you to have fellowship with demons. See, he's having the right to the church at Corinth and tell them, stop participating in idol worship. Now, that might sound strange, but see, they were all idol worshipers until recently when they got saved. And a lot of them are saying, well, you know, it ain't no big deal. They're not really, there's really only one God. That's true, but there are wrong spirits involved in this. How many know there are places you don't need to go? Because there are wrong spirits in manifestation there. You just got no business going there. Or being there. Or seeing it. Or hearing it. Or being around it. Because if you get involved with them, you're winding up fellowshipping with the same spirits they are. And some of these spirits, these wrong spirits, all of them are God's enemies. Keep reading verse 21. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of demons. See, what communion is to us, this idol worship is to these demons. That's demon communion. I'm not going. I'm not participating. No. And you can tell it if we pay attention, you'd sense these wrong spirits. You'd sense the environment of these things. You, you know there's some bad things going on. You don't have to have a discerning of spirits. You don't have to have a vision. You, for lack of a better word, you can feel it. You can feel it when you walk in the door. You can, you can sense it when you come onto the place. Right? And unless they're going to listen to you and get saved, you just need to turn around and get out of there. Oh boy. Yeah. <laughs> Verse 22. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? We. We. He's including himself. Are we stronger than he? Yes, Jesus has paid the price for all the sins of the whole world. Yes. Yes, he's not holding our sins against us. But that doesn't change the fact that we have a living relationship with him. And if we choose to go against him and his word and his way and his will, if we choose to yield to wrong things, that will affect not our relationship, but our fellowship. You're not lost because you make a mistake. Right? You're not lost because you sinned grievously. You've acknowledged and received Jesus as your Lord. He's already paid for those mistakes. But that doesn't mean that you're going to enjoy full communion and good fellowship with him when you're palling around with his enemies. <laughs> Go to 1 John 2, please. 1 John 2. Thanks be to God. What is the ministry of reconciliation? What are, we, what are we telling people? Be 
reconciled to God. What does that mean? We might say it like this. Get right with God. Yeah. Yeah, somebody said, but Jesus has already made me right with God. Yeah, but you've got to receive it. You've got to receive it. You won't experience it. No matter, no matter that he's done it all, you, you won't experience it unless and until you believe it. You repent for being hard-headed and going your own way. Right? You acknowledge that God's right. And you've been wrong. And you receive. Oh, thank you, Lord. Receive complete cleansing and washing so that you don't have to have any condemnation or any guilt or any shame, but then you need to walk in the light and stay in full fellowship with him and stop doing things that take you away from him. Uh, 1 John 2, are you there? 1 John 2. Verse uh, 15, 1 John 2, 15 says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Now, the world, he's not talking about the earth. He's talking about the world system. The world, the ungodly world. If you'll notice, the Bible said Satan's the god of this world, and he is continually trying to get God out of everything. Yeah. Hmm? So that everything is Godless. You know, sadly, God's been taken out of a whole bunch of things yeah. in our generation, in our country. It's a bad thing. I said, it's a bad thing. And if the devil has his way. He take God out of everything. But we still enjoy some great freedoms too. Here we are, preaching unashamed, believing unashamed, right? Got full freedom, control over what we believe, and how we live. Somebody say, thank you, Lord, for this country. Thank you, Lord, for our country. Thank you, Lord, for our freedoms. But he tells us, don't love the ungodly world. Don't love the things, the ungodly things that are in the ungodly world. Because if you do, it's a replacement for the love for God. Do you see that? This is his enemy. You don't want to love his enemy. Right? Right? That affects your fellowship with him. He still loves you, but you love that, that he hates. You love what he detests. He still loves you. You're still his child. But is it possible for a child and parent to love each other and have a relationship, but no fellowship? Oh, yeah. Yeah. There's parents and children hadn't spoken to each other for years. No fellowship. Don't love the world. Don't love the things that are in the world. Now this is not just, you know, don't love a, uh, we shouldn't love things anyway, but it's a matter of the ungodly part of it. The ungodly part of it. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Somebody said out loud, I love God. I love love the Lord Lord. with all my heart, all my my soul, all my my mind, all my my strength. strength. He said, verse, verse 16, keep going, all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of the life is not of the Father. That's the problem with it. It's not from him. It's not of him. So if we love it, we're loving something that's not him. But it's of the world, the ungodly world. Verse 17, and the world is passing away. It's foolish to love it because it won't be here but just that much longer. 
and the lust of it, but he that does the will of God abides forever. He's going to be around forever, and those that love him are going to be around forever. Somebody say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hold your place there in 1 John. Go back to uh, 1 Corinthians. I know I'm bouncing around a little bit, but the Lord's helping us. What, what do you think? He's helping us. Oh, thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. I told you wrong. It's 2 Corinthians 6 is where I, I'd like for you to go. 2 Corinthians 6. Second Corinthians 6. Sadly, a lot of have, uh, Christians and churches and ministries have become much more like the world. And uh, it's not for us to, to judge anybody, but it's for us to be on the, on the watch that we don't do it. Did the Lord say, the scriptures say, don't be conformed to this world. So you got to watch when you're making changes to make people feel more comfortable that are coming out of the world. You want them to feel like the place they're coming is similar to the place they left. Do you see what I'm saying? And you got to watch about implementing things from ungodly events and activities into the church in the name of making yourself relevant. Because have you asked the Father what He thinks about it? Have you asked the Lord what He thinks about you bringing that ungodly stuff into His things? We're not to be conformed. We're to be transformed. Yeah, right. Hallelujah. Yeah. We're not to be like the ungodly world. We're to be so different yeah. that they don't like it. <laughs> that the ungodly world doesn't like it. If the world likes you and is okay with how you do everything, you got problems. They didn't like Jesus. They didn't like Paul. <laughs> Second Corinthians and six and fourteen. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship? You see the word there, fellowship. Could also be translated communion. What fellowship or communion has righteousness with unrighteousness? What's the answer? None. It they just don't, don't, doesn't mix. What communion has light with darkness? Important to remember this phrase. What communion has light with darkness? What's the answer? None. None. Verse 15, keep reading. What concord has Christ with Belial? Name for the devil. None. What part has he that believeth with an infidel? None. Keep going. What agreement has the temple of God with idols? We've been talking about that. None. We should, nobody should confuse us for a temple of a false god. Is that right? We don't smoke everything up with incense like they do. Is that right? We don't chant like they do. No. There should be no similarities. <laughs> He said, I'll dwell in them. He said, you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I'll dwell in them, walk in them. I'll be their God. They'll be my people. Does that sound like full fellowship? Does that sound like complete communion? This is completely reconciled to God. There's no odds different between you and him. There's no, nothing between you and him. Verse 17, wherefore, what did the Lord say? Come out from among them and be ye separate, says the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. 
and I'll receive you. If the Lord says, that's nasty, leave that alone. <laughs> now we're laughing, but I'm as serious as I can be. If the Lord says, child, that's nasty, quit playing with that. What should you say? Yes, sir. yes Father. Right? Yes, Father. Quit doing that. Look at you. You're all dressed to go to Sunday school? And what did you get into? You're out there jumping in that mud hole. What? Come here. <laughs> On your way to church, you're jumping in a mud hole. Now we're laughing, but you can be 70 years old and be doing the same thing spiritually. Doesn't mean that God hates you. Doesn't mean that God's cut you off. Doesn't mean you're lost. He's still your daddy. He still loves you, but he doesn't like that nasty stuff. It's like, quit that. Come out of that. Separate yourself from that. Is, are there nasty things in the world? Spiritually, there's a bunch of defiling, ungodly, unclean, distorted, perverted, twisted stuff that we got no business with. No business listening to, watching, talking about, handling, going there, being a part. And it's not about you being a, a nice, holy, holy little Christian. This is about between you and your father. Right? About you having unhindered fellowship with him. Walking in the light instead of walking in the darkness. He's not in the darkness. He said, come out from among them, be separate, says the Lord, touch not the unclean thing, and I'll receive you. Keep going. I'll be a father to you. You'll be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Hallelujah. Woo. Keep going. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Well, I thought the Lord had already uh, forgiven us of all sin and cleansed us from everything. Is this New Testament scripture I'm reading? Huh? Are there things we need to remove ourselves from? Yeah, the Lord has already paid the price for it, but we won't access it and enjoy it if we choose to stay in it. Right? No matter how, how much your mom washes you up and puts the clean clothes back on you, if you go right back and jump in the mud hole again, we got to solve the problem. What's the problem? You wanting to jump in the mud hole. <laughs> That's the problem. <laughs> and you need to separate yourself from mud holes. Is that right? And by doing so, you cleanse yourself from the filthiness of that and you're perfecting holiness in the fear of God. You're walking in what has been bought and paid for. You're walking it out experientially. Hallelujah. Praise God. Go, go to 1 John and I'll just introduce this next, <laughs> next point. Can you come back? Yes, sir. Okay, good. Good. First John, where you are maybe holding your place. First John 1. Man, this, this epistle is it in what we're talking about in reconciliation. The first, first John, it's all here. It is here so beautifully. Let me say very adamantly, First John is written to believers. All of it. There's only, according to Jesus in the gospel account of John, there's only one sin that the Holy Spirit convicts unbelievers of. Not believing on Him. That's it. No need in arguing with unbelievers about drinking or drugs or immorality or cussing. Or, that's not their problem. Hmm? That's not their big deal. Their big thing is believing on Jesus. That's the sin 
that can separate them from God is rejecting him. So that's the only thing to talk about when it comes to unbelievers. But he's talking to believers here in 1 John, and he's talking about sin. Uh, 1 John chapter 1. Well, I tell you what, look in, look in chapter 2, verse 1, then I'll back up. Well, I need to establish this because the people are saying some, some goofy things. In 1 John 2, 1, he says, my little children. Would you assume these are believers he's talking about? His spiritual children. These things I write to you that you sin not. Can a Christian sin? And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he is the propitiation, the appeasement, the satisfaction for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Can you conclude he's talking to believers? Why, why would you say not for ours only, but for the whole world? He's talking to believers. So back up in chapter 1, one, verse 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, this is 1 John 1, 1, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled, he's talking about Jesus, of the word of life. For the life was manifested and we've seen it and bear witness and show to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. That which we have seen and heard declare we to you that you also may have what? Fellowship, fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. That is eternal life. To know him and to know Jesus. Verse 4. And these things write we to you that your joy may be full. <laughs> you can tell how well a Christian is doing in their walk with God by their joy level. You can tell it. Closer you are to him, the more light and life you're walking in, the more joy you'll have. And his, his plan, his will is that our joy be full, that our fellowship is full and unhindered, and our joy is full. Well, that's your strength too, isn't it now? The joy of the Lord, your strength. Verse 5, this is the message which we've heard of him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no, no darkness at all. Now this just undoes a bunch of unscriptural teaching and preaching. If it has to do with darkness, it didn't come from him. Because how much is in him? How much darkness is in him? None at all. The, the, the Greek here is very specific. Uh, not even any is the way you could translate it. Verse 6, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we're lost. No. We're lying. We're not lost. We're lying about it. And not doing the truth. Now in order to understand the rest of this and going into the next chapter, you have to include that phrase, walk in darkness. What's this about? Fellowship. If you're, if you're walking with God, you're walking in the light. Hmm? What if you're walking in darkness? You're not walking with him because he's light, right? But if you say, if you're walking in some darkness, hmm, if you've been in the mud hole, you got mud on you, right? God is clean and him's no mud at all, right? So you can't say, and, and, and your friends say, you, how'd you get all that mud on you? You said, I was walking with God and got this mud on me. No, you didn't. Because there ain't no mud in him. You couldn't have got the mud from him. You're lying about where you've been walking. 
We're lying. And we're not doing the truth. Now verse 7. But if we walk in the light as he's in the light, we have fellowship. Fellowship. One with another. Now this is talking first about us and him. One with another. But it also affects each other. We have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Ongoing. From all sin. Verse 8. If we say we have no sin. Now again, you've got you to include the phrase. This, this refers back to if I'm walking in darkness and I say I have no sin, I'm deceiving myself. Hmm? And the truth's not in us. Verse 9. If we confess our sin. I'm still talking about reconciliation. Right? If you got mud all over you. You got your nice Sunday clothes nasty. Huh? How are you going to get it right? The Lord told you. Stay out of the mud hole. Right? The mud hole's not of me. In fact, it's a stinky nasty mud hole. It's not just muddy, it's putrefaction in there. I mean, it's nasty. There's diseases in there. It's ugly, nasty, dead stuff, evil stuff. Stay out of it. But here you come up, splattered and stinking. (laughs) And the Lord looks at you. (laughs) How are we going to fix this? Somebody help me. How are we going to fix it? Let me tell you how you don't fix it. By saying, there is no mud hole. <laughs> there is no mud hole. And I don't know what you're talking about. This is not how you get reconciled. By pretending there's no mud hole. Pretending you hadn't made any mistakes. What do you got to do? Confess. Hmm? Do you remember what happened when Adam and Eve fell? God came. Huh? What did he say? Where are you? Adam said, I was scared so because I, I was naked and I hid myself. He said, who told you you were naked? Did you eat of the fruit I told you not to? See, when you're confronted with light, what's it time to do? Huh? Where, you, how'd you get that mud all over you? Oh, you stink. What did you, what did you do? Don't lie. Don't pretend. Don't deny. What do you do? I've been in the mud hole. I've been, I know you told me not to. And I, oh, I stink so bad. I'm sorry. I know it. I know it. Forgive me. If you'll confess it. Huh? What will he say? He'll say, baby, the washing machine still works. Come on. Come on. (laughs) Huh? Baby, the bathtub still works. Come on. He's faithful. And here's this word we were talking about earlier. What? Now he can be fair and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you. From all. All. Oh, somebody say all. 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 Unrighteousness. Are we talking about reconciliation? There is the reconciliation that the lost one needs to do. Be reconciled to God is our message to every unbeliever and lost one. How do you do that? You don't have to try to remember all the mistakes you've ever made and every sin you've ever committed. The Lord paid for all of them. What you do need to do is believe this good message and then you need to come and fall on your knees before him and humble yourself and repent that you've acted a fool in denying him and acting like you hadn't needed a Savior. You need to repent and then you need to Receive. Hallelujah. Receive the new birth. Receive the cleansing, the washing, the righteousness. But what if you are saved? What if you've been born again for 40 years? And you ignore what the Lord tells you to do. 
You override your conscience. You yield to the flesh. You yield to things that are not right. And you become defiled. Are you lost? No. No, you're not lost. If you've been palling around with God's enemies, does that affect your fellowship with him? Is he okay with that? No. No. How do we get it fixed? Come on, help me out. How do we get it fixed? You don't pretend nothing's wrong. You don't go around acting like you didn't mess up. You come to him. I said, you believe and you do what? You repent. You repent. You acknowledge. I violated. You know, to him that knows to do good and does it not, to him it's sin. Whatever's not of faith is sin. I, I, I knew better, Lord. I knew better. I confess it. I acknowledge that. That's wrong. But you don't wallow in condemnation. And you don't tell lies that he's mad at you. He's not mad at you. He just wants you to stop it. Right? You repent. And if you'll do so, if we'll confess our violations of light, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us and wash us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So that our fellowship now is fully restored and our joy is full. Can you say amen? Stand on your feet, everybody. Oh, praise God. Praise God. Praise God.